Welcome back, church family. Hope all of my brothers and sisters are doing fine, doing great out there. Um, <clears throat> before we get to the devotional time, I'd like to just update you on some of the re prayer requests that have come in over the past week. Um, we need for you to pray for Jasper. His uh, surgery is coming up on the 16th of this month, so please pray for him. The Kiners have already made their way uh, to him, and uh, we want to be praying for their safe return when uh, they find it necessary to uh, travel back up to Virginia. So pray for Jasper, pray for the Kiners, if you would. <clears throat> And then pray for our brother, Ronnie Connor, who took a fall several days ago and took a pretty good blow to the head. Uh, he's doing better, but uh, st still needs the Lord's healing. So pray for Ronnie. Also, Eva Aldridge. Um, she went to a new doctor yesterday and just pray that the doctors would be able to give her uh, with give her guidance uh, as, as far as where to go from here. Pray that God would give these doctors the wisdom that they need to determine what uh, she needs. And then Brother Bob Eshelman is going to be having some testing done tomorrow and uh, then two more on June the 22nd to determine what's causing him to have some issues with numbness and weakness in several parts of his body. So Please pray for Brother Bob. Uh, these episodes are happening more frequently. And uh, pray that the doctors would be able to determine what's causing these problems. And then Rob Craig will be having a test to determine if he has a hiatal hernia real soon. Pray about that. And uh, again, remember to pray for our, our police officers and first responders as the riots continue across the United States, we uh, definitely need to be praying for our politicians right now that God would give them wisdom, particularly in light of uh, the fact that uh, they're being challenged in many corners of the nation to defund the police, which would be a, a very tragic thing. Uh, so pray for wisdom, pray for boldness and courage in the face of this challenge, if you would. America needs a lot of prayer right now. <clears throat> then I talked to Linda Ayers today, and many of you have already received the email that her uh, grandmother, actually Tony's grandmother, Grandma Ayers, is declining. And it looks like from what Linda's being told that she has at the most... Uh, about two weeks to live, but she could pass into the presence of the Lord really at any time now. So be praying for grandma heirs and the family. Also Denise Ucrop and her dad, Alton Moody. Uh, just a reminder to, to keep John McDonald in your prayers. I talked to Charlotte today and John's uh, still holding his own. But uh, Charlotte took a fall on May the 20th and landed on her shoulder. She's, she's still having problems with her shoulder. So pray for our dear sister Charlotte. And then uh, Jackie Nelson is asking us to pray for her neighbor's sister. Uh, her neighbor's name is Brenda and her sister's name is Shirley. So we want to pray for Shirley. She's in ICU and uh, don't know the reason why, but uh, Shirley and Brenda just lost a, another sister about just two months ago. So pray for Shirley in ICU. And then if you would, be much in prayer for the message I'm to bring Sunday <clears throat> out of 2 Peter chapter 1 verses two through four, uh, probably will not get beyond verse two on Sunday, but 
Um, without sounding egotistical, I, I really believe this message is going to be a very profound message, a very enlightening message. I think it's one that could greatly improve your lives. And uh, I encourage all of you to uh, tune in, either come to the church or watch uh, the broadcast through Facebook or YouTube. Uh, I've meditated on this passage for many hours, and uh, God really showed me some things, that some insights that really got a hold of my heart. I think it'll make a difference to you. But I would ask you to pray much for the message I'm currently experiencing uh, some balance problems which have accelerated in recent days uh, to a level beyond anything that I've experienced before. So I'd appreciate your prayers for that. I don't feel like it's anything serious. I think it's something metabolic. It may be a silent migraine uh, condition. And I'm going to uh, an ENT doctor on Friday just to make sure I don't have any kind of infection in my ears or any of that sort of thing going on. Uh, so pray for that. I, I don't want to be uh, hindered in the ministry that God's given me. And uh, when I get like this, it, it uh, slows me down a little bit and I don't want it to affect my productivity or clearness of mind when I get up to preach and I really hope to make a clear presentation of this message Sunday morning. I'd like to encourage more of our folks to begin to come out to church on the Sunday morning service. I think uh, the way things are looking right now that the risk are fairly, are, are pretty minimal. Uh, for the last several days, the deaths from the coronavirus in the state of Virginia, the entire state, have been in the single figures. And uh, I'd like to see more of you start coming out. Uh, obviously, and we've tried to do this too, and that is to use good common sense. And uh, we've done our best to take the proper precautions at church. And I think once we use common sense and do what we need to do, then it becomes a point of just uh, trusting God and uh, to take care of us. And uh, nothing's going to happen to any of us until God's finished with us here. At the same time, I realize we don't want to do anything foolish or stupid either. So I would encourage you to come. Uh, if you still have concerns about that, then we do respect uh, that. So, but uh, be much in prayer again, if you would, for the upcoming message this Sunday morning. Thank you. To begin our devotional time uh, this evening, I'd like to share with you once again uh, another great text from uh, Scripture that had a tremendous impact upon American history. After King Henry VIII severed ties with Rome and appointed himself head of the Church of England in 1553, three groups of Protestants emerged. Uh, first of all, the Anglicans, who continued the traditions of their church. Secondly, the Puritans, who wanted to work within Anglicanism uh, to reform and purify it. And then thirdly, uh, those who were separatist and dissenters determined to establish their own independent congregations. Over the next hundred years, the Puritans and the separatists faced extreme pressure from the English crown, compelling the, many of them to flee the uh, country. The great Puritan migration led by John Winthrop occurred between 1620 and 1640 resulting in the establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the founding of Boston. But before these Puritans were the separatists, those who came to Plymouth Rock on Cape Cod aboard the Mayflower in 1620. The pilgrims, as we call them, were dissenters 
who had been, as one historian put it, harried out of the land by various British monarch, monarchs. And many of them fled to Holland, where one congregation led by Reverend John Robinson flourished and tripled in size. But these dissenters grew concerned at how easily their children were being assimilated into the Dutch culture. They were strangers in the land. And somehow an idea arose in their hearts to immigrate to the new world where they could establish a colony to freely pursue their English customs while retaining religious liberty. It was a breathtaking idea. With the exception of Jamestown, no English colony had survived in the New World, and Jamestown was hardly an exception. It was a disaster. Of the 3,600 settlers sent to Jamestown between 1619 and 1622, 3,000 of those perished. Going to the New World must have seemed to these dissenters like colonizing the moon, yet they felt compelled to go. They said, quote, It is not with us as with other men, whom small things can discourage or small discontentments cause to wish themselves home again. As one of them, William Bradford, uh, would later write, they knew they were pilgrims. Their beloved pastor, John Robinson, was heartbroken when he realized he couldn't leave with the bulk of his congregation to travel with the pilgrims. He hoped to join them later, though death would keep him from fulfilling his dream. Unable to go himself, Robinson led his church in an emotional send-off. About 125 church members had signed up for the first voyage, with the rest planning to come later. Robinson proclaimed, as the historians wrote, a day of solemn humiliation, on which he delivered a passionate sermon based on Ezra 8.21, which is about Ezra leading the remnant of Jews from exile to the Promised Land. Robinson's text apparently encompassed the following verses of that chapter. I read in Ezra chapter 8, beginning at verse 21. Then I proclaimed the fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Robinson didn't choose the passage at random. The, the eighth chapter of Ezra tells the story of Ezra's leading a remnant of Jewish pilgrims back to the promised land of Israel from their exile in Babylon. It would be a hard and dangerous trip, but Ezra wanted to direct the hearts and minds of his people to the protective hand of the Lord who was leading them. Robinson must have felt like a modern-day Ezra and indeed, in many ways, he was. After his sermon, Robinson led the congregation in, to put it in his words, quote, powering our prayers to the Lord, unquote. He then traveled with the pilgrims to the Dutch port of Delft Def Shaven, where as the historian wrote, their reverend pastor fell down on his knees, and they all with him with watery cheeks commended them with the most fervent prayers to the Lord. From Delft Shaven, the pilgrims sailed to Southampton, where they boarded a creaky little ship called the Mayflower. 
for our devotional tonight, I'd like to share with you a verse that's had somewhat of an impact upon my life lately out of the book of Jude. And uh, for me, it was a much needed impact and something that I'm still working on. But anyway, if you wanted to put a title to this devotional, it would be simply this. You can make a difference in someone else's life, exclamation point. If you're burdened for someone who isn't serving God the way you used to, it's time for you to do something about it, and, and uh, me as well. Worrying is not going to bring about the changes that are needed, but turning that worry into action can make a big difference in the outcome of that other person's life. You can make a difference in someone else's life, and that is precisely why Jude, in verse 22 of his book, tells us, and the some have compassion making a difference. Do you see the word compassion in this verse? This word is taken from the Greek word eleo, uh, which in this case refers to deep-seated, and let me emphasize the definition here. It refers to a deep-seated and unsettling emotions a person feels when he has seen or heard something that is terribly sad or upsetting. Again, compassion is a deep-seated and, and concerns or refers to deep-seated and unsettling emotions a person feels when he has seen or heard something that is terribly sad or upsetting. <clears throat> There, there are kinds of emotions that well up inside of us when we see a child whose stomach is bloated with malnutrition and starvation. You might also feel these emotions when you see a person who is emancipated and dying of terminal cancer or a destitute family that is forced to live on the streets with no food and money. Jude's purpose in using the Greek word eleo is very plain. He's doing exactly what television programs do when they, you know, they, they flash their pictures of, of starving children with bloated stomachs on the television screen in front of us. The producers of these programs show us these kinds of worst scenario pictures in order to stir us to action. These pictures of desperate misery from third world countries are flashed in front of us while emotionally moving music plays in the background. Then the celebrity host on the program says in, a, in an impassioned voice, pick up your phone and call today. You could save the life of a child. These kinds of television programs are designed to stir up emotional feelings of pity. The producers of the program realize that simply stating a needed uh, or stating a need verbally would never get our attention. We're just too mentally busy in today's society. Therefore, they make the need as graphic as possible, uh, knowing that pictures speak a thousand words and are much more effective in arousing pity from our hearts. However, arousing pity is not the ultimate aim of these programs. The horrifying pictures and emotional music background, musical background rather, are, are designed to convince you to pick up your telephone and call the number on the television screen and make a donation to help the cause of the sponsoring organization. This compassion to act and to do something is the moment when pity is transformed into compassion. I want to say this again because this is what Jude is getting at. This compulsion to act and to do something is the moment when pity is transformed into compassion. I think most of us define compassion as 
no more than a feeling of pity for someone. But that's where we're wrong. A feeling of pity for someone doesn't make a difference, but rather a pity that motivates us to take action is what makes all the difference. By itself, pity would simply feel sorry about the situation, but compassion cannot sit and idly watch the scenario grow worse. Compassion reaches out to act immediately and to do something about the situation. It is unmistakably clear that Jude wants to elicit an emotional response from his readers. He wants them to graphically see and understand the seriousness of believers who have backslidden into a life of sin and disobedience. He wants his readers to feel for these critically ill spiritual patients. In fact, he wants them to feel their con condition so intensely that he says, and of some, have compassion. In other words, Jude is telling his readers to take that pity and turn it into action. Real compassion says, I have to get up and do something about this. Because, because Jude uses the word compassion, he is telling us that the spiritual condition of a backslidden believer is just as real and serious as the plight of a starving child, a dying man, or a destitute family. If you will allow the love of God to flow through you, it won't be long until compassion for these erring believers begins to flow from you to them. Then you will be compelled to see them set free from their bondage. That compulsion is the activity of compassion. You may think, yes, but those believers knew better. If they had stayed faithful in their walk with the Lord, they wouldn't be in the mess that they're in right now. Isn't it their fault that they're in trouble? And the answer to this question may be yes, they are to blame for their condition. However, consider this. Wouldn't you have compassion on a homosexual who contracted AIDS due to his own illicit sexual activity? Although his own actions got him into the mess, wouldn't it still grab hold of your heart when you saw him or saw his body wasting away, wouldn't his helpless condition make you wish there was a cure for, for AIDS? In the same way, even though a sinning believer may have gotten himself into trouble because of his own actions, we must not therefore shut off the flow of God's compassion that resides within us. Believers who have become spiritually deceived need a touch of God's power more than they ever did before. Therefore, um, we cannot let the enemy sow hard-heartedness in our hearts toward people who have become spiritually ill or backslidden. Their plight is very serious, and they need our help and prayers of intercession. If you know people that fit this description, it's time for you to let the supernatural compassion of Jesus Christ begin to flow out of your heart toward them. These error-ridden believers need a divine touch from God that will open their eyes and bring them back to the Lord by releasing a flow of this powerful force toward them. You could set in motion the very deliverance these individuals need from the powers of darkness that bind their souls and keep them in deception. This is why Jude urges us to release this delivering flow of compassion when he says of some have compassion making a difference. This kind of compassion is a mighty force that reaches into the flames of judgment to snatch people from destruction. Why not? 
open the bowels of your heart and allow this supernatural flow of compassion to start flowing through you today. Just think, by opening your heart and letting compassion flow through you toward these people, you could be the very one God uses to bring them back home again. May God help us to that end. And let us pray for one another that we would have great compassion for those in spiritual need. Amen.